On December 28th of 2000, in the Mill Creek section of West Philadelphia, a thundering barrage of gunfire echoed through the drug-infested neighborhood known then as the Bottoms. Police officers were dispatched to 816 Lex Street, long known to area police as a crack den where drugs were sold and used within the house. When police made their way inside, they discovered 10 people laying sprawled on the floor in pools of blood. Seven of those 10 bodies were lifeless. The victims, Alfred Goodwin, 54, Edward Sudler, 44, Ronette Abrams, 33, Calvin Helton, 19, Tyrone Long, 18, George Porter, 18, and Samuel Harris, Jr., 15. The extreme violent nature in which the massacre brought shock and anger to the crime-besieged neighborhood. A demand for justice was made to the city hall and police were tasked with bringing the persons responsible for this to justice. The three surviving people who were shot were questioned by homicide detectives. Along with neighbors around the surrounding areas, the only description homicide detectives had to go on was four black men wearing masks were seen fleeing the scene and police now are responsible for solving the worst mass murder in Philadelphia history. Officials at first believed that the murders were the result of a drug deal gone wrong, being that two of the homicide victims were known drug dealers. Shortly after the killings, four arrests were made. Jermel Lewis, 23, Hezekiah Thomas, 23, Sakan Yuk, 19, and Quiante Perrin, 19. Then, at the time, prosecutor Roger King charged full steam ahead with what the DA's office considered a quote-unquote slam dunk of a case because they had the right people in custody. However, despite the claim, the prosecution had no physical evidence tying the four suspects to the scene. The only evidence was one of the surviving victims, Yvette Long, who was the aunt of one of the deceased accounts of what took place. And the confessions of one of the accused suspects, Jermel Lewis, which many said was coerced, and he later recanted, saying it was forced under duress. After 15 months of preparation and the trial less than three months away, a judge dropped all the charges against the four, freeing them after spending 18 months in jail. The wrongfully incarcerated sued and received a $1.9 million settlement, which was split four ways after attorney fees. The case grew cold and police still had no suspects. And that would remain for several months until the following November when brothers... Dawood and Khalid Farouki, 27 and 26 years of age, Bruce Venny, also 26, and 19-year-old Shaheen Black were charged with the seven counts of murder, along with three counts of attempted robbery. Shaheen Black was originally a suspect in the case, but later was released after detectives didn't believe his story. Black would later plead guilty to avoid going to trial and received seven consecutive life sentences. Bruce Venny, who was the lookout and did not participate in the murders, pled guilty and in exchange for his testimony received 15 to 30 years in prison. The Faruqi brothers were later also found guilty and avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty and giving up their right to appeal. They were also sentenced to seven consecutive life terms in prison. So the question is why the murders took place and what was the motive? And it was all laid out in court by the prosecutor. Originally, investigators thought the shooting was due to a drug turf because it was well known that the drug house where the dealers were working out of would sell individual pieces of rock cocaine for as cheap as $3. But that was not the issue. Shaheen Black told police he had traded a Chevy Corsica and $300 for George Porter's Dodge Intrepid. Porter had tried to use the Corsica stick shift and blew out the clutch, being that he did not know how to drive a five-speed manual. After the car broke down, Porter went to try and get his car back, which by that time had been traded to Dawood Faruqi for a pistol. Porter wanted his Dodge back, but refused to pay for the damaged clutch. After leaving, the following evening, Porter went back to take his car back with an extra set of keys he had. It was this bad car deal that seven people were murdered. 
The night of the massacre was to get the Dodge Intrepid back and rob all of those inside the house. But during the robbery, Dawood's mask fell off. He began shooting to protect his identity, and everyone followed suit. A $129 part would have prevented the murders of seven people. Here we are in West Philadelphia. We are walking on Lex Street. And I'm going to say this place is not as bad of a neighborhood as I thought, but it's still pretty dicey around here but they fixed it up quite a bit and uh that is 816 north lex that is where the massacre occurred and uh looks a lot nicer they've rebuilt everything rehabbed everything so yeah i can tell i can tell that this is one of those neighborhoods where one block will be nice one block not so nice and oftentimes when I do these neighborhoods get out of this truck's way as I was saying as this truck passes me a lot of times when I do these neighborhoods I'll read the comments and people will say oh that neighborhood is not that bad oh why are you disrespecting my neighborhood you're making it look bad uh, my intention on this channel is to not uh, offend or upset anybody uh, but uh, I guess I'm one of those idiots that sees with his eyes I don't know I blame my mother for that but from the looks of it this neighborhood just for me driving around for the last 15 minutes. I will say, not as bad as I thought. Still slightly, uh, just a little bit dicey, so. It looks to me, however, that gentrification is slowly encompassing this neighborhood, but um, nonetheless, uh, rest in peace to all the victims of that horrible massacre. Uh, needless violence, needless death. Okay, guys. I'm out of here. Be safe, y'all. Peace out.